this is a watercolor that I did on Arches paper. It is um, it was just an exercise that I was doing because I haven't painted in watercolors in a while. I've been concentrating in oils and I just wanted to get my hand back in. Now as you can see this is a, a figure painting and I'm just starting out with a basic silhouette and I'm not worried about one color flowing into another. As a matter of fact this style is conducive for that. You actually want that. You want to be careful not to over uh, mix your colors and then you, you just wind up with a mud. But if you start out, lay your colors in and just leave them alone, one of the beautiful things about doing either uh, a figure, a section, or doing the whole painting where you sort of block in with colors flowing into one another, you don't run the risk of everything being hard edged and sort of like a coloring book. I also am starting out with some fairly bright colors. It's uh, a good rule of thumb. You can always dull a color down, but brightening them back up is problematic. It can sometimes be almost impossible. I'm using just a large oriental calligraphy brush. I like them because they can uh, do a real broad uh, flat wash or they can do uh, they can be brought down to a point so that's really nice it makes them very versatile where you can actually use one brush to do quite a bit then I do swap over to a synthetic and so I'll bounce around a little bit uh, in this case I'm using a uh, maybe Utrecht, um, I'm not really sure, doesn't really matter, I just encourage you to go and look for brushes and uh, maybe experiment with them a little bit in the store and see if it's got good spring and what you think about it and uh, if it seems nice, buy it. I don't often buy brushes on online anymore and that's a shame because they can be cheaper and uh, I really like a lot of the brushes from Jerry's and Utrecht and Dick Blick. The problem is it's not them, it's the manufacturers. They make brushes and within a year they discontinue and they start out another line which you don't know. You don't know what that line is the equivalent of that you've been using. Also the number system is just completely arbitrary so you might buy uh, a number four which is very small and one brand and then you go off and buy a number four with another brand and it's huge or it's so tiny it's only like got a couple of bristles in it so you can wind up with a whole lot of brushes that are all kind of the same size so that's where and then you know they can get damaged so I, I don't say never but Unless I absolutely know the brand and what I want and I'm familiar with, then I prefer to go to a place like Michael's or Hobby Lobby where I can pick the brush up and look at it and see. You'll notice that uh, on a pretty regular basis I sort of feel the uh, paper with the back of my hand or back of a finger. And what that's doing is just letting me know at what stage of drying the paper is at. Um, depending on what you're trying to do, if you're trying to do a, well, a dry, uh, work dry on top of something, well then obviously you want the paper dry. But there's also a very sweet spot that watercolor paper will get to where it's wet enough for the pigment to flow and be manipula manipulatable but it's not so wet that it uh, bleeds and just almost explodes from one area to the other in a very uncontrolled manner. So uh, that's just a good way if it's kind of cool to the touch uh, and it has a slight dampness then that's sort of that sweet spot. Now as I'm blocking this in one thing you may notice is in the face 
I sort of do a uh, just a real simple uh, shape for she's almost in silhouette for the face and neck and you know in retrospect looking at it uh, had I tweaked it a little bit that really could have very much been enough and said plenty about uh, this this particular uh, model or figure in this painting. Matter of fact, it could have been great and just left alone. But in this case, I actually wanted to work in the uh, face a bit. And sometimes I, I, I'll have to admit, I think that's sort of a weakness of mine. I've been a portrait painter for over 30 years, and it's just very difficult for me to look at a face and not want to render it because uh, I love to, to do faces so much. But I will say sometimes that's pretty rare. Most people want to avoid faces because they don't feel like they can do them. So we can have faults in either direction. Uh, but in this particular case, I just wanted to point out that with just a little bit of uh, rendering, just a little bit, I could have done that, maybe just around the eye socket or something, just put a little bit of soft, blended uh, shadow in there, and this would have been perfect. You've got uh, a mid-tone and a highlight, and that little bit of shadow would have been a dark, and the um, hair is actually framing out the face real well. So that's just to let you know that you can do a wonderful painting without having to go heavily into rendering. The only thing I would just suggest is make sure you're not doing it because you're afraid, because you don't feel like you have the talent or skill to be able to uh, render it out and paint it or draw it correctly. And you'll see as I'm working, uh, since I didn't have any preliminary drawing down, I'm sort of slowly but surely feeling the figure out. Uh, can be particularly challenging to do something like a transparent dress like this. This uh, I don't think it's a tutu, and it's not a tutu, it's just a, a ballet dress that's sort of a mesh so it's see-through and you can uh, see the figure up under it well rendering that out so that it you you just feel the figure under there and you see a little bit of it that can be a bit challenging but you know you just sort of work it out you start looking and and uh, seeing where the figure is and then you render it with a soft edge that's the that's the biggest thing is not being so quick to go in and just carve something out with these hard edges and by building up just a couple of values there aren't really that many values in the dress really arguably about three then you can have your mid-tone your highlight mid-tone and shadows and what I tried to do here was just sort of block everything in as a mid-tone at the beginning and then come in and do, I would argue, almost just a deeper mid-tone for carving out the leg and the uh, folds in the dress, but never really going super dark, dark. I don't really in that dress have too many really super dark darks. I have I have it more in the bodice and of course in the ha face and hair. And you'll notice now I'm starting to render out the um, face and what I could have done again was even if I went a little further than just sort of a shadow around the eye socket I could have just done a little bit of rendering out the eye and then leaving it alone and that would have been fine so it's sort of 
how far you want to carry it. If you're sort of a beginner, I actually encourage you to go on and render out the face and render the face in all sorts of different interesting and challenging uh, ways because you want that experience. And you'll see that there was a jump from where I originally blocked in to more of the finished face. And that's just because I didn't want to just laboriously sit there and render and render and you see what I was doing because a lot of it, as with anything, uh, it can get, uh, well, literally like watching paint dry where you're uh, correcting this and then uh, moving things around and restating and then correcting again and pushing the paint around until you've, you're happy with what you've got. I kept the rendering on the hands uh, somewhat limited, again, not because I can't, but because uh, I, I felt like I had enough. I didn't need any more. Um, so often in painting, less is more. Uh, you don't want to over-render and just say too much. You take the mystery out of what you're doing you take it to a point where you, well, you might as well just be take a photograph and leave it alone. But you don't want to sit back and go, oh, I'm afraid I, I don't know how to do this. Oh, well, that's not good either because you want to be able to attack a painting, attack a subject with, with gusto and with confidence and with a sense of fun and not be afraid of anything that's in front of you and I love doing these small studies that's probably a I don't know seven and a half by eleven I think is what the, this winds up kind of being and I just love doing these little things because they're uh, relatively quick uh, you can just have a lot of fun with them now in a second I'll be uh, doing the background and I don't necessarily encourage you to do the background exactly the way I did this time. Uh, if you're not afraid to cut into your figure or cut into what you've already painted, if you're so, if everything's so precious that you're afraid you're going to ruin it, then go on and paint it all at the same time. Don't do it in a segmented fashion or that's exactly how it'll look. But if you'll notice as I was painting, uh, I mean, I try to be careful, but I don't care if one section bleeds over into another. It's pro probably a lot better because you lose that edge uh, where it blends together. And edges are the, the hardest thing for most beginners and even more advanced painters to deal with. You, there's a tendency that everything's either soft and amorphous or everything's sharp and hard and carved out. And you just want that balance. So it's good to sort of paint the whole thing all at one time and not do sections. And here, right here at the end, I'm just using a little bit of casein. Uh, you could use gouache as well, just to do the little flowers on top of the dress. And I think that about wraps it up. This was just a quick little demo I wanted to do, just to get my hands back into watercolors and casein. If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist.